was that? <laughs> <laughs> that was me. Great. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think we'll begin now. My name is Greg Dunahy. I'm director of the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History here at Trinity College at the University of Toronto, or virtually here at Trinity College, the University of Toronto, because I am not there. I'm hunkered down by myself in Ottawa. I'm not going to speak very much. I never do at these events, but I do want to thank our partners in the CIC, the Toronto branch, for joining us in this uh, in this event, and in particular, Daniel Lees, who's providing the technical support, without whose um, uh, support we would not be here. I also want to thank, in particular, Ambassador uh, Mayer um, from Switzerland, who is joining us today as, as the host or the chair of this session on um, the international security implications of uh, COVID-19. Uh, I think we're very, uh, um, very lucky to, to have her. She's a distinguished Swiss diplomat who served in a number of places around the world. Most recently, she was a special advisor, a diplomatic advisor to the president of, the Swiss, of Switzerland. Before that, she was posted as the number two in Beijing, and she's been here in Canada for just over a year, and we are uh, super lucky to have her. So, Ambassador Mayer, without any further ado, I should turn it over to your very capable hands, and I hope to see many of you at other Bill Graham events as we go forward. So, thanks very much, and welcome, and Ambassador. Well, thank you very much, Greg, and good morning, everybody. It's um, for me a great pleasure to be your moderator today. Um, the COVID crisis, as we know, is, is a health crisis, but uh, we also know that it might turn into an economic crisis, might turn into a political crisis, might turn into a social crisis. In any case, this pandemic is a disruptor. It slows us down. We're all staying at home at the moment, but it also accelerates trends. It might undermine the rule of law. It might undermine the protection of human rights. Uh, it might undermine the protection of vulnerable groups, uh, empower autocrats or foster disinformation. But it might also uh, strengthen accountability, transparency, uh, fact-based decision-making, uh, solidarity, global cooperation and innovation. And throughout all of this, uh, it might, of course, impact the future of power dynamics. Uh, it is, COVID is a game changer and it's up to us to decide which way this game is going to turn. Um, and for that, we need to understand the risks. Now, to discuss this, we have um, here three eminent experts, uh, Mark Humphreys, Rosemary McCartney and Bruno Jarbonneau. We'll kick off with uh, Mark. Um, He'll give us the historical perspective, the historical context maybe of what is happening today. Uh, Mark Humphreys holds the Dunkley Chair in War and the Canadian Experience and is Director of the Laurier Centre for Military, Strategic and Disarmament Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. He's amongst others the author of the book, The Last Plague, Spanish Influenza and the Politics of Public Health in Canada. Mark, avoue. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Greg and to everyone who's uh, joined us here today and to the other panelists. Uh, my role as an historian here is, I think, to just kind of set the context as, as best I can. Um, I guess I'd begin by saying that historically, epidemics are obviously a, a common occurrence in the sense that if we go back through history, we can point to numerous epidemics um, that have been kind of uh, inflection points for various reasons in um, social, economic, political history. Medical historians though debate the degree to which these epidemics actually provoke long-term social and political change. Um, I'm an expert in the 1918 flu, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes here. Um, but I guess what I would say first of all is that the current crisis we're in now is unprecedented in the sense that um, I can't think of another historical uh, epidemic which has created as much disruption uh, in such a short period of time uh, as, as the current one. Um, the only one that comes to mind is the Black Death of the 1300s. And in terms of uh, the types of disruptions that come out of that, they're probably going to be more widespread or, or more long lasting than what we're seeing today, but they're also very different. The 1918 flu, I think, is an example that I, I've at least been asked um, by journalists to comment on uh, frequently during the last uh, couple of months. And there's a desire, I think, to see parallels between what happened in 1918 and what is happening today. Um, in some extent, though, or to some extent, those parallels are, are clear. Uh, to an, in another way, I think we have to be very careful in drawing those parallels, and I'll explain why. Um, first of all, the 1918 flu was at least 10 times worse uh, in terms of mortality than what we're experiencing today. Uh, in Canada, as an example, best estimates are that about 3,200 of every million Canadians died uh, in 1918. And at the moment in Canada, the uh, well, mortality from coronavirus is about 71 per million. Um, even in the worst hit places in the world in Italy right now, it's about 281 per million and Spain about 510 per million. So even by those estimates, um, the Spanish flu of 1918 is a, was a far more serious disease. What's remarkable, I think, too, though, is that despite kind of the, the superficial similarities between then and now, um, things like wearing masks, for example, in public, um, some of the attempts to uh, control the disease through non-pharmaceutical interventions or what we're calling social distancing now, um, none of the things that were attempted in 1918 come anywhere near as close to what uh, we're attempting to do here today. In the sense that in 1918, the non-pharmaceutical interventions and social distancing measures that were brought in uh, were, were often haphazard. Um, most public life didn't actually shut down, even though that seems to be uh, the common narrative that's out there. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that in detail during the uh, question period if people are interested. Uh, but just to give you one example in terms of Canada, in 1918, the world was already at war. Canada was already at war. Uh, no wartime munitions factory shut down, for example, in Canada. And indeed, munitions factories accounted for uh, a significant part of the Canadian um, employment in 1918. So these parallels, I think, that we draw between then and now are often superficial in that sense. Um, the legacy, though, of 1918 is also a lot more complex, I think, uh, than um, perhaps sometimes uh, we're familiar with today. It wasn't until the late 1990s that most people even knew about the 1918 flu. Um, in 1918, the flu spread around the world in about three different waves. The first wave went largely unnoticed. Uh, the second wave was the wave that everybody remembers as the most deadly wave. It's when most people died from the 1918 flu. And the third wave was a lot more like the first wave, but because it followed the severe mortality of the fall, people were more familiar with it. Um, what happens in, in 1919 and 1920, though, is that the war comes to uh, uh, an end through negotiated peace in the spring of 1919. And in many ways, the memory of the flu becomes subsumed by the memory of the war. So again, this is where history is important in terms of chronology. And we have to think about the way in which human beings have a profound, I guess, capacity to forget as much as we do have a profound capacity to remember. Uh, when that severe wave of flu happens in the fall of 1918, we're talking about uh, a world that is in the midst of the most severe fighting uh, that's taken place on the Western Front since the beginning of the war. 
Uh, between August and November of 1918, more Canadians are killed or wounded than in any other period during the war uh, overseas. And indeed, the fighting reaches kind of this um, great intensity just before the armistice on November 11th. And by the time the armistice comes into effect on November 11th, the flu is already largely spread around the world. Uh, it's reached its peak in the United States and Canada by that point. It's peaking in England and it's, it's beginning to peak in, in most parts of Europe. So when it comes time to negotiate the peace in the spring of 1919, the world has already kind of largely passed through the flu crisis. And although there's a decision made to try and create a, uh, well, it's essentially the forerunner to the World Health Organization today, it's called the Health Organization of the League of Nations, which is created as a part of that treaty process. Like a lot of the things that come out of the 1918 flu, it largely, you know, uh, loses its connection to that pandemic event. Uh, within a couple of years of, uh, in the 1920s. And what's remarkable is that by the time we get to the 1970s, when the first histories of the pandemic are being written, historians are describing it as essentially a forgotten epidemic. And they're marveling at the fact that it killed so many people and yet so few people talk about it or remember it. When I began researching the flu in 19, uh, well, in, in about 20, uh, 2005 or so, it was still a largely forgotten epidemic. People talked about it in those terms. And it's only really since the avian flu scare in 1997, SARS in 2003, and then the swine flu in 2009 that we've seen flu go from being forgotten in 1918 to a, a, a now I think widely understood or at least widely remembered event. And I think that this is an important point for us to remember that when we're kind of looking at a crisis in the middle of it, it can look very different than when we look uh, at it in the rear view mirror. And I think to some of the points that were raised a few minutes ago, um, one of the things that I think we have to be clear about is that this could well be an inflection point in a number of different ways, right? And we don't know at this stage which way it's going to go. What I want to do for the last couple of minutes here is just talk about, I think, some of the ways historians might look at this current crisis in the future, the way I'm kind of looking at it as uh, um, an historian right now. And I think I have about three minutes left. Is that about right? Yeah. Um, when we look at what's happening today in terms of um, the trends that we're seeing develop. I think there are two possible ways I think that the, this can go, at least to me at the moment, or the way historians would look at it. On the first hand, what we're seeing is, yes, uh, it, it, the development of policies based on scientific modeling uh, and based on, um, uh, well, largely handing policy making in many ways over to experts, which uh, is happening on a grand scale across the West. And I think that the way in which the effects of that are, are remembered or at least play out is going to depend on two things. One, obviously how those policies themselves work. If the modeling, for example, which so many of the lockdown strategies that uh, countries are relying on today, if that modeling turns out to be unreliable or problematic for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with the modeling itself, but more to do with unknowns about the virus, um, that's going to have one obvious effect. It's going to probably uh, lead some people at least to question the basis of that policy making. But the other problem is that the modeling itself and the policies themselves are so complex that it's a communications issue. How do you, for example, communicate um, the basis of a lot of the policy making we have today and the modeling that we're actually using uh, in a way that most people can understand? A model as an example of an epidemic can be largely correct even if the variables that you input into the model were wrong. That's not a fault of the model. It might be you know, a lack of understanding about the reproductive rate of the virus or a change as, as scientific knowledge uh, develops. But the problem that I think is gonna face uh, um, policymakers and politicians around the world is that as these things evolve, as they will do, the question is going to be, how do you communicate the fact that the evolving nature of the crisis itself is not a failure in policy. It's, a, it, it's actually um, part of the evolution of the policy, uh, or the evolution of a crisis itself. You don't know at the beginning all the information or, or, or all the key points you need in order to actually make these types of decisions. And I think the real risk here is that those types of issues can be politicized, right, in a very easy way in the sense that you can begin to question the basis of that uh, decision making. And in fact, a lot of those pre-existing trends that we have seen uh, developing in the past decade or so could well be exacerbated by this move towards populism, a rejection of elite uh, or so-called elite uh, decision making and uh, expertise, that sort of thing. And I guess that's kind of the point that I would conclude on here, which is that 
if you think about it, historians have generally argued that epidemics have a limited capacity to provoke long-term independent change. They don't tend to provoke new trends. What epidemics tend to do throughout history is they tend to exacerbate underlying tensions, bring um, you know, things that have been kind of on a simmer for a long time to a boiling point. And my expectation is that if we want to understand what the long-term expectations are, the long-term ramifications of the current crisis are, we have to, again, go back to those, uh, those tensions, those simmering things that have probably been on uh, the back of the stove for a long time and brought to a boil by the current crisis. So I'll end there and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, this was an excellent scene setting, context setting uh, from the historical perspective and what struck me uh, is that you point out similarities um, between the uh, 1918 pandemic and, and today, but also the differences, and you pointed out the consequences that came out of that, amongst others, sort of the, the seeds of international coordination or cooperation in the international, uh, through, the, through the health organization. Right. And uh, I think that's also a, a big difference to today, in the sense that today we do have the UN, we have an international a system um, and Canada, of course, as a member of the G7, the G20, and I believe a sixth time member of the United, uh, the UN Security Council um, is a strong voice defending a rules-based international order. Uh, now the question of course comes up, um, how does this pandemic impact this order? How does it impact our international system? Uh, how, how, uh, how strongly can this international system react to what's happening and, and contribute to solutions? Um, Rosemary McCartney will give us uh, her analysis on this, but before I pass over to you, I might just, uh, I should just add that you can ask questions um, uh, for the panel, to, for the Q&A session that follows the presentations by clicking on the Q&A button on your screen. And uh, please feel free to ask your questions. I'm sure you have many. Um, Rosemary McCartney is the person, Sabia Visiting Professor at Trinity College, uh, University of Toronto, and she is an award-winning humanitarian and business leader, and she served as Canada's ambassador to the UN in Geneva, uh, with responsibilities for the World Health Organization as well, from 2015 to 2019. Rosemary, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Meyer, and um, also to the Bill Graham Center and the CIC. Um, perhaps I could begin with the obvious premise that um, everything, we know that everything in the world is connected today, and certainly a global health pandemic is by definition probably the best manifestation of our global connectivity. And it's why we're, uh, what the point that I would like to try and make is why collective action is going to be necessary, is necessary, to address this global crisis, but it's also an opportunity to collectively seize opportunity out of the crisis. And that's why you will hear me say often and frequently multilateralism matters and the institutions of multilateralism or even the variations of plurilateralism that we're seeing today, they need to be supported even when they're imperfect. And, and the, the thing that I find in the current dialogue on the multilateral institutions, Mark mentioned the World Health Organization, is that those institutions are the ones we collectively created in the decades since World War II. And if they are imperfect and if their governance is imperfect, they're creatures of our, of our um, design. Uh, and it's something that we'll need to grapple with as we go forward. As Ambassador Meyer said at the beginning, COVID-19 is a health crisis and we, and we need to hold on to that because while it has humanitarian and trade, human rights and international security impact, it, it's first and foremost a health crisis with consequences. And it will, it, and it continues to be and will continue to be both an accelerator and a decelerator on international security threats. So I've been thinking about COVID-19 a little bit like a balance sheet you know, the good and the bad, and it's still being revealed. You know, um, there's been good leadership, bad leadership. There's been good civic and societal activism and, and um, destructive ones as well. And so, you know, we're, we're in the middle of it. So there's a lot of conjecture and the final tally is not clear. 
um, and especially with international threats. You know, we tend to think about them in terms of three risks, accidents that happen, miscalculations in crisis, and then malevolent opportunism. And crises simply make all of these more likely. And as uh, Mark said, um, this epidemic and crises exacerbates a lot, exasperates things to a boiling point. So some of the threats that are weighing on the minds of security people everywhere because of COVID-19 would include the issue of border closings. So with border closings, we know have come supply chain disruptions for essential products, for spare parts, for food, and for flows of people. And when you have scarcity and panic and conflict outbreaks that trigger mass movements of people, both you have both national and regional security issues that can quickly become global security issues. When you have lack of humanitarian access for people in need, which is the UN's regular work of feeding hungry people, vaccinating vulnerable children, providing medical care for mothers and newborns, if all of that is diminished or gone because of a pandemic, societies become destabilized. And there's no venting for the pressure buildup, that boiling point that Mark mentioned, because the borders are closed. So you're creating pressure cooker type situations. The second threat that um, is certainly um, apparent in the daily headlines is the open competition instead of cooperation for scarce medical supplies, which has resulted in new forms of piracy. You know, we used to think about high seas piracy. And a couple of weeks ago, what we were watching was airport runway piracy happening. And, and you know, our, our Deputy Prime Minister characterized, you know, supply chains and, and procurement as a wild west out there. Well, that doesn't augur well for vaccine development and vaccine distribution and access, which should be and must be a global public good. We can't have a country or corporations cornering a market for a scarce vaccine that the world is, is very dependent on um, coming onto the market um, as soon as possible. The third threat uh, that I would mention is the destabilization of financial markets and capital markets. So these threats are very different. It's not just military threats, but the destabilization of financial markets, which brings with it the collapse of not just companies, but also countries who are unable to service their populations, who are unable to trade, to feed people, to protect the vulnerable, we, leads to um, heightened political instability. And within political instability, that um, malevolent opportunism comes to the fore. The fourth thing I would say is we need to talk about the fall of empires. So for example, um, COVID-19 is one of those accelerators. So our most critical ally is disengaged from cooperation in the world. It's flouting the rules, behaving unpredictably. China is feeling highly vulnerable and stigmatized for its handling of the early stages of COVID-19. So the issue of miscalculation or accident when other powerful nations can't predict a response that in normal times would be quite clear, the unpredictability becomes acute and the superpowers in a corner are never very predictable. Um, and as Mark said, the superpower relationship, this, this exacerbation of things that already existed before the pandemic, the superpower relationship going into COVID-19 was already highly dysfunctional. The fifth thing is the explosions of populism, which again, we're seeing across the headlines, which in turn create volatile hotspots. So when you have the reassertion of narrow notions of sovereignty and self-interest, um, heavy-handed security responses to COVID-19, opportunistic curtailments of human rights. It sets the stage for years and years of instability and civil unrest, which will in turn slow the recovery. And then the sixth and last thing I would say is militaries are weakened. Um, the example of the major aircraft uh, carrier docked because several hundred sailors on board tested positive for COVID-19 world leaders sickened by COVID-19, like the UK Prime Minister, the rumors this week of the North Korean um, leader being sick or, or, or worse, um, various cabinet ministers, including in Iran, being sick and unable to do their jobs. All of these things create instability at the top and that notion of opportunistic um, bad actors uh, gets widened further.
And then I, I would just say the absence of the UN Security Council action in the face of the pandemic is also extreme concern um, for all of us. They've acted well in two major health crises in the past, on HIV and AIDS in 2003 and 4, and on Ebola in 2014. This is their job, to act in times of threats to international peace and security, and to require, require, because they can do that, coordination and effective action by member states, to take no action that would threaten peace and security, and to take steps that would accelerate member states in the world to get out of this crisis. So the Security Council could call on member states to implement the technical guidance of the World Health Organization, to reinforce the Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire. It could require member states to, to provide adequate infrastructure, um, protective devices to, for the protection of healthcare workers. Um, they could mandate the opening of supply chains for essential medicines and vaccines and the distribution of those things in a humane and equitable way. And they could call on the international community to respect international law and international human rights law, particularly in the situation right now of um, actions against refugees and the rights of refugees. So if the UN Security Council doesn't act soon, um, that hit to its credibility is also a world security threat that we're going to have to deal with because we need the Security Council as the um, pinnacle of the governing body on international peace and security. So why am I opti I'm an optimist? Why am I optimistic? Well, some argue that actually a global health crisis promotes peace and security because no one wants to escalate further tensions or accidents or miscalculations. Militaries tend to be twitchy when there's a crisis and no one wants to start something they can't finish. So some people argue, you know, it is conducive to peace and security. The second thing I would say is that we see stronger and more representative alliances stepping up, like the G20, to fill the gaps caused by the failures of the Security Council, for example, to act, at least so far, and I'm still hoping it's going to act. And the G20 represents two thirds of the world's population, 85% of the world economy, highly representative body. And that last week they did step up in the call for making sure that when a vaccine does become available, it's protected for the greater public and global good. And then the last thing I would say is, you know, perhaps this crisis gives us pause to fix some things and to rethink some other things. So we need to ask, what is this new normal that everyone's talking about? And what do we want it to be? And, and, and we can and we should be writing that narrative and determining right now, what, what can we choose versus what are the predetermined givens as we contemplate the next decade? And how do we widen the choices now on things like non-proliferation, on disarmament, on climate change? How do we use this opportunity or this crisis to create the opportunities to widen our choices because crisis as i said at the beginning is about seizing and creating opportunities to reopen smarter and to build back better and so let me just conclude by saying you know we one thing we know for certain with all of the uncertainties with COVID 19 is that public health now and forever will be a core national security requirement just in the Canadian context, the Canadian 2004 national security policy had eight, um, identified eight major threats to Canada. Number one was terrorism, and number eight was global pandemics. So I think I can say with some confidence that um, COVID-19 will indeed redefine what we all mean by national and international security. Thanks. Thank you, Rosemary, for your insight, also your experience that came through here, and um, also your optimism, which I think we need uh, in order to mitigate and to, to sail uh, these difficult times. You mentioned the importance of continued cooperation, multilateral cooperation, but also just cooperation amongst countries. And uh, that reminds me of the initiative taken by, by Canada recently to form this informal ministerial meeting or ministerial exchange on how to manage everything that goes along with COVID. And maybe that's a kind of uh, initiative that shows the future of how we will have to adapt our type of cooperation. Um, 
You also mentioned, um, as Mark has already, that this, of course, happens in a context, in a situation, and I might want to use that uh, to, to, to introduce uh, our next speaker, because what I find is that globalization, as we know it, as we've seen it over the past 20 years, since the wall of the, the 30 years by now, since the wall, uh, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, has already been in considerable stress. You know, we're talking about the financial crisis, and you mentioned uh, the financial financial system as one of the the risks um, of of this crisis as well. But we also have the climate crisis. We have, and it feels like ages ago, but we've just had Brexit only two months ago, um, and they are all symptoms and effects of maybe an underlying dysfunction of globalization, the way it is organized today, and. Um, it does beg the question, how does the pandemic factor in? How, how does it impact financial market? How does it impact uh, the economic system? And to talk about this, we have um, our next speaker, Bruno Charbonneau. Uh, Bruno is professor of international relations at the Collège Militaire Royal de Saint-Jean and director of the Center Franco-Paix en résolution des conflits et missions de paix uh, à l'Université du Québec à Montréal. A prolific scholar, uh, his work on global security issues has been published widely amongst, on this, amongst others in the Review of International Studies, International Political Sociology, International Peacekeeping, Les Tons Modernes, Afri Contemporaire, or the journal, the Canadian Journal of Political Sciences. Bruno, à vous. Merci. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Thank you to Bill uh, Graham Center and CIC for organizing this. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, my starting point is actually uh, somewhat different in that uh, I think this crisis, yes, of course, it starts with a, a virus. It's a health crisis. But to me, it's a 80% of political economy crisis. That is, it's about the choices we will make and the struggles for particular choices uh, that uh, are the stakes, if you will, of this crisis. So the question uh, today I wanted to, 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 to discuss was how is uh, COVID-19 impacting or affecting conflict dynamics and international responses to conflict dynamics? Uh, to talk a little bit about the geopolitics and therefore the stability of international system and whatnot. Um, so I'm going to talk about a bit about what happened, what is happening, and maybe I'll end with what might happen, where I think this might lead us in terms of uh, trying to um, show off my crystal, crystal ball, perhaps, or, or, or just uh, uh, insight or, or encourage a discussion. Um, so I'm going to talk about two things, UN Security Council per se, so that's, that's my, the, the way I, I want to talk about uh, those global dynamics of international security, and also a little bit about the WHO, and then in conclusion, how the two, I think, mix together, uh, um, and perhaps in the Q&A, we can talk about the financial crisis as well. Um, first, a little context, or two things I want to underline, because obviously the crisis did not uh, happen in a vacuum. So I want to um, point to at least two things here that are important to, to remember. The first thing is that this pandemic, and I'm sure my colleagues would agree, and Ambassador too, was not a strategic surprise, right? Um, uh, like Rosemary said, uh, Canada was expecting it was on, on its, list, uh, its list of uh, national security threats. Uh, so both at national levels, uh, within a lot of, most national security apparatus had uh, these analysis pointing out the fact that such pandemics could happen and were a threat to uh, national security or international stability. And you could say the same thing about our international organization. And obviously, the, uh, um, the rise of the WHO is, is one indication of how, internationally speaking, that sort of threat was taken seriously. The other context or thing uh, that must uh, uh, absolutely be underlined, and it, it was uh, address a bit by Rosemary as well, is how fractured the UN Security Council was, and in particular the P5, the permanent five members with veto powers. And so uh, the, at the UN Security Council, we could say at least three sort of fraction or, or stress, if you will, before the crisis. One was the power shift that the, a lot of people were pointing at, meaning that basically US leadership was 
losing ground to other rising powers. So shifts in, ter- in economic and political terms, moving where, that's a debate, obviously. Uh, but a lot of people are talking about perhaps the end of the liberal world order, or certainly the threat to multilateralism, as Rosemary underlined. Um, but but the, 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 the fractured or the stress through that system is also in terms of its relevance and efficiency in the sense that how can it handle, was it able to handle new challenges, even old challenges, and especially to, to whom was it responding, in other words. Um, which brings me to the third crisis, uh, w- which was one of the legitimacy, and I won't go into that one. Rosemary again talked about it, but certainly uh, the Trump administration and the different governments have raised uh, questions about the very legitimacy of multilateral bodies, uh, their purpose, and so on and so forth. So, so that's the context. Um, so let me begin, about, I'll talk a bit about the UN Security Council. The UN system in general was pretty slow in reacting to the crisis. It started probably reacting to it, uh, taking it seriously in early March. And I think the turning point is uh, most likely in the, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, called for a global ceasefire on March 23rd. That was immediately supported by uh, many countries, including Canada, that signed letters of support to the UN uh, Secretary General. About 70 countries uh, signed uh, such uh, support letters. On 2nd of April, you also had the UN uh, General Assembly that voted a unanimous non-binding resolution for more global, encouraging more global cooperation uh, to respond to the crisis. So, so beyond the, the UN Security Council, you actually had, uh, have, uh, I think, a lot of people, a lot of organizations, a lot of governments who support both the call for a global ceasefire, but also more international cooperation and collaboration. If we look at the UN Security Council, however, it's another story, obviously. The UN Security Council has been inept, has so far not done anything. It's, they've been debating, let's call it that, uh, over this and that. And there are rumors since at least uh, for the past few weeks, every week there's a new rumor about it, an upcoming resolution, but we're still waiting on it. And the two uh, key, probably, uh, um, uh, um, dimensions of that block, if you will, or that ineptitude, uh, or, or pettiness even, as some have uh, written about it, uh, talks about one, the, the dynamic between the U.S. and China, obviously. The, there's a blame game going on between the two. Uh, the Trump administration blaming China, calling it Chinese virus, as I'm sure you read in the news, and the Chinese replying to that, that you know they did everything they could, but perhaps also the American army has um, implanted a virus or that sort of thing. So, that, so there's a lot of propaganda going on there and a blame game going on. But the other aspect also is the US and Russia uh, basically uh, being afraid that the global ceasefire might uh, affect or impact negatively their counterterrorist terrorist operations across the world. So the so US are worried that if they, they agree to a global ceasefire, uh, their operations against the Islamic states and perhaps also in Afghanistan and elsewhere might be affected. And the Russians are worried that uh, what they call counter-terrorist operation in Syria might be affected as well. So th- those are probably the key two, uh, 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 if you will, um, element of debate there or, or blockage at UN Security Council. But certainly what we, we see at the UN Security Council along here, what it clearly shows, I think, is how both the US and the Chinese are not ready or able to lead uh, the UN Security Council or lead uh, in this time of crisis. And you know, you could compare, you can make all sorts of historical comparison like Mark said, but you, you can also go very, you don't need to go that far back. You can just look at the, the stark contrast in terms of international response to the Ebola crisis in 2014. Uh, obviously, that was another context that the virus was in West Africa and U.S. leadership under Obama was something else. Um, so just a, a few words now on the WHO uh, and how then I'll conclude how that ties to the UN Security Council uh, dynamics. The WHO, what, what uh, we should need to say, uh, I have three things to say about the WHO. First, it's an international organization uh, that is 
that, that become or does what its member states wants it to do. So in other words, it doesn't have the authority that perhaps uh, the Trump organization, uh, our administration and others have given it to it. it. And its main mission is one of surveillance. It's not about police action or responding crisis per se, but it has been set up to, to surveil uh, and, and, and make sure that if something happens, if there is a crisis happening, like in China, obviously in December and January, that it raises up the, those red flags for then states to take action. So the WHO, the way it is structured, is really focused on state interest and the protection of those states and state members. It is especially uh, organized in a way that protects northern states. The key assumption uh, uh, at the WHO is that most of its activities will be in the global south. In other words, most of uh, 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 the, the planification uh, um, plans at the WHO is based on the assumption that more activity will be made in the global south and will deploy it in a way to protect the global north from those pandemics that could arise, like in West Africa in 2014. Obviously, with COVID-19, this assumption was proving wrong, of course, and that, I think, partly uh, explains uh, uh, the, the current uh, politics around the WHO and certainly the debates uh, between the Americans and the Chinese on this issue. So if you, we put that to, together, what can we say about COVID-19 in terms of international politics, in terms of UN Security Council dynamics and so on and so forth? One thing's for sure, and uh, this is not new obviously, but COVID-19 has exposed and is exposing the, the, our international power structures and power relationships and the inherent inequalities within those structures. And especially, obviously, as these structures relate to the nexus of war, geopolitics, and medicine. Because I, and I come back to my early point about how I think this is 80% of political economic crisis in the sense that when, a, let's say, a vaccine is created next year or whatnot, who will get it first? Uh, how would it be deployed? Who will produce it? And so on and so forth. These are the key uh, political de decisions and struggles that we'll see in the near future. Um, and then in terms of conflict dynamic international responses to, to those conflicts, I'd say that in the short term, what we can expect uh, is a lot of focus on obviously crisis health management, which likely means that we we'll won't see any uh, uh, further conflict or intensification of armed conflict, that is. Um, and we can look at how people and uh, governments and armed groups have responded to the call for a global ceasefire. Most governments and rebel groups in Colombia, Philippines, uh, South Sudan and elsewhere, have, uh, I mean, the, the practice of it or the response to it is something different on the ground, but at the very least, people have agreed to, um, to respect or try to respect that ceasefire. In the mid long term, however, and that's probably where the discussion should be and the big questions should be raised. Um, if we add to this health crisis, the economic crisis that is on, uh, up, well, is ongoing right now and will probably become even bigger than a lot of people expect. So it ties back financial system, but also to all of these people who will lose job and whatnot. Uh, and, and therefore the global flows, and we'll go back to the, the, the question about what is the future of globalization, that sort of thing. This is likely the biggest test for the UN system, because on top of that, at UN General Assembly, for instance, I'm pretty sure that we can expect in the near future, a lot of demands for humanitarian aid or development aid. When uh, conflict, uh, countries in Africa, perhaps, or the Middle East or elsewhere will ask for aid from the UN system or from international financial institutions in terms either to respond to their health crisis or in terms of the uh, reconstruction after the economic crisis, um, what will be the response? Are we going to see more division? Are we going to see uh, the global north basically erecting more walls between the north and the south? Or will we see more international solidarity? And will that impact even the functioning of the UN system? Are we going to see here the UN Security Council basically defending its privileges? Or will it have to respond to these pressures that will come from pretty much everywhere, I suspect? So we'll end it there, um, yeah, but like Rosemary, I, I, 
you know, I have my good days and my bad days. Uh, sometimes I'm a bit optimistic because I see a lot of people trying to get, get together and organize and uh, a lot of solidarity out there. But there's also those big power players who don't seem to want to play that sort of game. So, and I think that those conflicts, uh, that conflict between the, the, those powerful players and the others uh, will uh, define uh, the, the UN Security Council and the UN system in general in, uh, in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruno, for this um, insightful uh, and, and wide um, analysis of the challenges looking towards the future. And I think we probably all share with this optimism and pessimism uh, um, change in our minds. There are opportunities, there are challenges. I guess the, the way we address them, and that's a big responsibility in, in a way it's even a privilege that we have the possibility to, to indeed make this pandemic um, or, or foster some positive dynamics out of this terrible pandemic for global security. Um, we've received a number of questions um, and I'll just start with a general one, doesn't address one of the speakers to whom I say thank you so much. Um, uh, specifically, it's an anonymous attendee and he asks or she asks to everybody, what are steps at the multilateral, national and community level that can be done to rebuild trust? This could be to address the the, the racist responses, quote, we have seen towards vaccines to national governments, WHO, etc. Maybe if I can start with you, Bruno, what's, what's your take on this? How can we reestablish trust? Is that yes. the question? Yeah. Uh, between who exactly? How, how can we, what are the steps at the multilateral, national and community level uh, to rebuild trust? And the person who asked the question refers to what you also mentioned, you know, the playing game, uh, racism towards uh, perceived uh, introducers of, of, of the pandemic, etc. So how might be also tacked into yeah. what I believe Mark said about the importance of communication. So how do we rebuild trust? Well, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, you know, if you agree with my assessment that both the US and the Chinese have demonstrated that they can't lead, they can't somehow bring people together, then the question is how do you do that without or despite them, right? Uh, and that's a really tough one because you can't avoid them, basically. Obviously, the Americans and the Chinese being the, the powers that they are. Um, you know, the, the EU could have uh, uh, at some point uh, used that. They certainly, the EU certainly relies on multilateral bodies, but the EU has its own problems as well. And they're, they're also dealing with uh, some government's populism, the rise of populism, whatnot, that question the multilateralism as well. So how do you get all these middle powers? Maybe, you know, the, I mean, I, I'm hoping the UN General Assembly can become perhaps uh, a place where people could, uh, and given the, the, the leadership of the UN Security General as well, then the two out can ally together to bring to the UN Security Council table specific question. The UN Security General has that authority under Article 99, if I'm not mistaken, to just bring to the UN Security Council specific questions and issues and demand an answer, basically. So that, that I, I suspect that those coalition uh, 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 need to be built at UN General Assembly despite uh, what's happening at UN Security Council. Having said that, there's a lot at stake in the US election, obviously, in November, right? Uh, what happens if Trump is reelected or someone replaces him? Can we, could we see that rebuilding of trust like under the Obama administration after the disasters that was Iraq under the Bush administration? Obama, uh, um, you can criticize him in many ways, but his administration has uh, uh, in many ways uh, had rebuilt uh, U.S. leadership uh, within the U.N. system. Uh, can we see that uh, with a Democratic candidate uh, winning the election in November? Um, 
but but let's assume that in the next few months you will that where will that leadership come from it's a really tough question i don't necessarily have the answer beyond what i've just said i think i think antonio guterres has, uh, needs the support of as many countries uh, uh, as he can gather uh, the un general assembly should give him that support uh, mid, middle powers like Canada and a lot of European partners should probably try to get the, uh, everyone on board to support is a, a call for a global ceasefire and go from there. Uh, but beyond that, I, 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 I'm honestly, I don't know, maybe Rosemary is a better answer than me. <laughs> How to rebuild trust. <laughs> Rosemary, you have something to add to, to, to Bruno? Well, I, you know, I, it's a big question and it, and it has uh, different you can take go from different perspectives but you know i think fundamentally if you if we're talking about building trust you know among populations across borders etc you know the coming out of this we have a huge dose of humility um the experts and the policy makers etc and, and you know that this has knocked everybody to the ground and so you know i think that by acknowledging that that you know this is this is complicated and mistakes have been made and institutions and people haven't performed perhaps at their best though some have you know truly have performed extraordinarily well um i think if you combine that with that kind of transparency um mark mentioned and bruno both mentioned about you know getting the facts out getting the science out with all of its problems and 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 errors etc um and then an acknowledgement that you know we're all going to be held accountable for how we perform and not in a punitive way, but rather in a, you know, continuous learning way. So we're set up better for the next one. And the next one could be next month, not, you know, 10 years forward. Um, you know, as you look back at the history, it's, it's not a, it's not new and we should, we knew it was coming and we know the next one's coming as well. So if you kind of take, you know, personal humility and a commitment to both transparency then you build uh, critical thinkers who are able to, you know, gauge fact and, and miss fact and, um, and be able to assess the complexities of science um, and a commitment to accountability and to review, et cetera, as we come out of this. And then I think if we, if we do, in fact, reopen SMART and build back better, we're going to create a lot of social and political capital to be able to you know, get things right so that we're in proactive, not reactive mode. So, you know, I think there's, there are real opportunities and we're seeing it manifested among some of the political leadership around the world here in Canada, for sure. Um, and, um, and I think though, you know, that's the optimist in me. I think there's been more good leadership than bad leadership so far in this pandemic. Can I, can I jump in real quick? Is that possible? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm gonna be the pessimist, if that's all right. <laughs> Um, that's what it's true. Somebody has to be. Right. Um, I, I guess what I would say is to begin with is that um, I think rebuilding a trust is, is going to happen at the international level after it happens at the local level and after it happens at the national level, um, that one follows on the other. Um, and I think we haven't yet seen how that is going to play out, right? In the sense that um, when we're talking about political capital, governments across the West especially have spent an enormous amount of political capital bringing about these lockdowns, right? And the argument that they're making is if you do this, then we can prevent deaths. And I think one of the problems that we run into is how those messages again get communicated to people. There's a widespread understanding, for example, I think just reading social media, that people believe that flattening the curve means you're saving lives. And in reality, what flattening the curve means, as an example, is you are simply spreading it out farther along the x-axis and decreasing uh, its peak. And that the area of the curve essentially remains the same. Uh, the number of people who will die of coronavirus is, is not lessened by flattening the curve. What you do is you reduce demand on the healthcare system, which can lead to excess deaths for people who can't actually get the care they need because the system's overwhelmed. And so part of the problem becomes in complex situations like that, how then do you explain to people when you see a highly effective flattening of the curve, which is what we're seeing right now in a lot of places, that in fact, you know, that 
you might have to then pivot as we begin to learn, for example, that fewer people are being hospitalized than we thought were going to be in those sorts of things. How do you pivot? And in navigating those types of questions of how you explain those nuances about how, um, uh, how many people will die and how, and how in fact you can uh, save lives or have policies that will um, uh, reduce suffering, that sort of thing. In trying to explain that to people, it's going to be an enormous problem for governments to try and communicate that message. And I think the real risk is that in failing to communicate effectively, both that the policies that we have brought in have been both effective or they may not be effective. This, this is where I think a lot of that, that battle will be fought about trust. And the reality is governments have spent a lot of the political capital bringing about the lockdowns that we have now. And if they run into problems, they're not going to have a lot left to spend to try and bring populations along on, on, on something else. So I think that that's kind of, to me, at least uh, the more immediate question before we get to the issue of, of international um, uh, organizations and, and, and relations between states, we have to address that question of, you know, what happens in the next six months as inevitably these policies shift and change? How do governments bring, the, bring people along or do we see reactionary movements develop um, and a heightening of uh, populism is just an example. If I may, just briefly, um, to the point of more, I, I think the temporal dimension is crucial here indeed that we're not coming out of this crisis in the next year or so and the, the number of deaths will increase no matter what we do, whether it's, like you said, it peaks or it just spreads over time. And, and to me, I, I'm not sure I would separate it the way Mark does, though, in terms of tr building trust within states and then the international being something else. Um, they, they are connected and, and it's really hard to to predict how people re will react. If uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of people, if not millions of, uh, of people die within a country, how will people react psychologically, emotionally, and how will that translate into political action or political decision? I, I have no idea. And I don't think a lot of people know about that. Uh, one thing's for sure is that the political stakes of these uh, decision and these moment and these reactions will uh, are crucial. And so, uh, the, the question of trust here is indeed crucial, but I don't know which way it will go. And internationally, I think the response is as important as the communication the governments will give us, because if there's no international cooperation, if there's, you know, uh, people, uh, governments overbidding over medical supplies, over vaccine, or even, you know, maybe uh, monopolizing uh, the vaccine and so on and so forth. That will affect how governments can respond, communicate with our population. And so that's why I say it's 80% political economy here, because these decisions and these battle and these struggles and these demands for X, Y, Z by either a local population or governments or big corporation and so on and so forth, to which point do people say, hey, you've given, you know, uh, $2,000 billion to save XYZ industries, but where I'm unemployed now and therefore I want this, this or that, how will that impact responses by governments and how will it impact uh, contacts between, or, or, or if you will, international solidarity between people who don't have jobs, for instance. So, so I wouldn't disconnect the two, I think they're related. But one thing's for sure, we, we have to keep in mind in temporal dimension here, it will be spread over one, two, three, probably five years from now, we'll still be talking about this as, uh, as it develops. And it will probably depend on how many people indeed die. And that, that, in that sense, I, I, you know, who can predict how many people will die? That's a, that's a hard one. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the temporal dimension. Uh, I just checked the time. We have three minutes left and quite a lot of questions. Many of those questions uh, refer, and I, I allow myself to just kind of sum it up in one last question to each uh, and one of you um, regarding the future of the international system as an org the international organization system, let's put it that way. Um, in three years or in five years, do you think the United Nations will have come out stronger as a leader out of this crisis? Or do you believe it will have fractured, there's more fractions and there's more conflict? Um, yes and no, and maybe one or two sentences. Uh, can I start maybe with March? Uh, 
Uh, I think it will come out uh, far more fractured. Um, I think the reality is that, although I understand what Bruno was saying a minute ago, um, what I would say is that for most people in, you know, Ontario, Alberta, or locally anywhere in the world, they're going to experience this crisis on a very local level and through unemployment, um, through, uh, you know, a variety of different things, in heightened domestic mm -hmm. abuse, all those types of things. And I think the, the issue is that this is very much a global pandemic experience at the local level. And that is going to exacerbate what I think was the existing move away from, uh, um, well, or at least the politicization of globalization in a way that um, would have been unanticipated even a year ago, right? So that, that's my, my two cents. Thank you. Rosemary? Well, I hope Mark's wrong. <laughs> I do. I think that um, the United Nations and its institutions are essential um, this decade for what we need to get done and, um, in, and to count on the various bodies. So it's easy for us to say, well, the Security Council hasn't operated effectively in this pandemic and, and many other crises. But at the same time, you've got all of these international organizations like the World Health Organization or UN High Commissioner for Refugees or the World Food Program all of those are working highly effectively and have not slowed, in fact, have accelerated their operations through this pandemic in impossible situations, but we don't hear about them until they touch us. And, and that's, the, that's the thing, that they're working in the background, day in, day out, vaccinating children, making sure the hungry are fed and, and so on and so forth, keeping the, the borders open, keeping trade flowing, um, and so we need to count up the, the UN organizations are essential for the, for the um, reconstruction and the recovery across the globe. And, and if they're not, then it's going to be a free for all of the most powerful and those who come out the most wealthy. And, and we, can, we can't let that happen. So I think it's incumbent on us to actually not give up on it, but actually to work harder to make sure that they, they, they are reformed, that they work better, you know, throughout, and that they're funded properly, and that their governance is set up in a way that they can operate um, at a high performing level, which, which they can do with the people they've got, but not with the governance that we've created for them. Very wise words. Pluno? Um, yeah, another easy one, eh? <laughs> um, I, th I think actually we'll see a bit of both. I think at the UN Security Council in the short term, we'll see more fracture, more debates. And then again, I come back to U US election, that could be a turning point here. But um, uh, while you'll see more fracture at that uh, UN Security Council level, I, like I said, I think they are, uh, there are hints of other things going on behind the UN Security Council. I, I'll go back to what I was saying about the UN General Assembly and the UN Security General. And to what extent, and I, I know the UN Security Council is basically in many ways the, the authority within the UN system, but you, you can go around it or you can put pressure on it. And that, to what extent can the Americans, the Chinese and the Russian just go against everyone else? Uh, in this case, they can just bomb or invade a country. So, so I, I have a bit of hope that, 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 that the UN Security Council could, or will have to change it, its ways or come together and work more closely perhaps with the in general assembly and whatnot. And the other thing too, I would, uh, I would say is, I'm wondering how much, and depending on how bad the economic crisis gets, uh, if we'll see uh, um, those economic discussion come back to the UN. I mean, the UN system used to talk about development. You know, it used to be at the core of what it was doing until the 1970s and the, the developing uh, developed countries said, well, you know what, we don't really like talking about that stuff at UN General Assembly, so we'll create the G7, right? So they extracted the, you know, development economic policy from the UN system and create, transform basically the Bretton Woods institutions in that, uh, by creating the G7. So I'm wondering, you know, given... Uh, the potential really economic catastrophe that's ahead of us, if that will not somehow, again, change those bread and woods institutions and bring them back within the UN system. And if that happens, I mean, it's pure speculation on my part, but if it comes back through the UN General Assembly and all these countries asking 
to think about a new economic international order, well, that could change the dynamics within the UN system as well. And it could bring back maybe some form of trust, or, or I don't know. But I, I seriously doubt the UN system will collapse or, or, or disappear for after this crisis. But it's definitely a huge, huge test uh, for the UN system in general and specific agencies or institutions within the UN system, for sure. And I think the UN Security Council certainly has the biggest test, personally, the, the eyes are, are on it right now and see what will happen there. Well, with that, unfortunately, I can't take any more questions. It's um, just past uh, just past 12. Um, but I would like, again, to thank you all. Um, I will leave this uh, event today with many questions, but better informed questions. And I think that's the best starting point. And also with the assurance that the international system, and particularly the United Nations, remain to be extremely crucial, particularly in managing this crisis, but also probably needs to adapt and reform. And as you just said, you know, will will be tested. Um, with that, I'll, I'll end today's event. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And on behalf of the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History, the CIC, and the Swiss Embassy, thank you for joining. Be well and stay safe. And Daniel, I will now close the live stream. Thank you all. Thank you.